I, th I think if you look at the consumer, you know that consumers want convenience, they want choice, uh, they're very interested in nutri nutrition and pricing is, is a big factor in the grocery business. I think we're finding that because of the economy, there are fewer new products being brought to market, but that those that are are being targeted to certain demographics. Millennials, for example, the younger crowd is, is a really important consumer base because you try and figure out what products they want. But I think the biggest thing that we see coming in in the grocery business, and it's already here, I shouldn't say coming, is, is health and nutrition. People of all demographics, young and old, are looking for healthier lifestyles. They want to eat better. They want to, they want to have better menu planning. But it's interesting, some studies say that, that while they want to be healthy, they don't necessarily buy healthy. And so there's a real push to work to educate consumers, not only in the grocery store, but more so understanding what they're learning before they get into the store. What is it that they're learning on their own through the internet, through wellness programs, through other things that when they get into the store, they have a different idea of what they're going to be shopping for as opposed to just coming in and, and buy what they used to be. So there's a change going on there. Manufacturers uh, are looking to improve the products that they offer. And so you're going to see, at least in the health discussion, products that identify omega-3s and, and other healthy things that they are going to put on the package to draw consumers to it. You know, there was a time when they wanted to have, you know, no fat and, and you know, zero calories, but it really bombarded the taste. So they're looking to modify that. So you'll see packaging and, and labeling come with, you know, a third less calories, a third less fat, but they're working hard to, to make sure they can maintain the taste because if it comes out flat and like cat cardboard, it's not going to move. Certainly you're going to see a reduction in sugar uh, as that applies to people's sense of what they're eating is healthy. Now while they may be willing to pay more for certain products and, and there's some sense they may be willing to pay more for local products, uh, you know, they are watching pennies and they're trying to figure out how to shop smart, how to use a list and a shopping list and kind of stay in a budget. And I think that cuts across all demographics. Our customers are primarily students as well as faculty and staff at the university. What I've noticed, and we've been open three years, and what I've noticed here is that the students are very informed, very well educated, and are very concerned about eating healthy. Uh, our produce trends are incredible. Um, our produce distribution to total sales is very high. Uh, as a matter of fact, higher than any other store I've ever managed in my 40 years of doing this. Uh, that tells me that the students are, and this next generation, are looking to eat healthy. What I find fascinating for, for this store is how much they're using technology. They use their iPhones their, or their iPads to look at information, look at nutritional data, um, look for value, but also looking at uh, low gluten, uh, calorie conscious, sodium conscious. Uh, we get a lot of requests for gluten-free items or lower in gluten. For, and as a matter of fact, the university brings their student, all their student athletes through this store and teaches them how to read nutritional labels to help them as they progress d during their athletic career here on campus or as they become adults off of campus. And they teach them how to read the labels, what to look for, what's most important, and how to help them become and lead healthier lifestyles. I'm, I'm very confident, and I tell the students a lot, is that I think this next generation is going to be so much healthier as older adults than, say, the baby boomers of my generation where we didn't have the access to technology and the access to information that the students have today. Well, again, in my, in my situation here, we deal primarily with smaller families, sing, either singles or couples, so I, I'm not dealing with large families. So my experience here is that they want smaller sizes, more single serve. Uh, this, the trend here is that they're buying every couple of days and they're buying fresh. We have a very low basket size or transaction size in comparison to my experience. But, they're looking for grab-and-go, health conscious, very healthy, not a lot of processing, and smaller sizes. But, that all, but the smaller size also helps with prices because it's a lower retail. So they're not spending as much money uh, at one given time uh, for, for that particular experience.
I know you, you've been uh, always bringing food to the community, fresh right. fruits. That's right. kind of your goal. I do that every day for 38 years. Yes. You are not a Latino. How do you I, feel working? You've been working so much with the Latino community. I, I, well, I grew up in the Latino community. I grew up with all different nationalities. You see, I'm, I grew up on the street of, uh, in Greece and in Chicago and in Milwaukee. So I know all nationalities. I, I have dealt uh, with all kinds of nationalities. Okay, right. and, I, and, I, and I love the, you know, the, the so many different variety of people. It gives me a chance to bring different things from different countries. And that's what uh, you know, makes me successful. That's, what I, that's how I grow. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you see any of the food trends changing over the last 10 years? The, the, the food trend? Yeah, what people want to okay, eat. Okay, uh, definitely the, the, the food trend is uh, people want to eat a lot of vegetables and a lot of fruits. There is no doubt uh, uh, specialty items, you know, like pomegranates now is in, uh, is, uh, is in abundance in this country and people are aware of a lot of new fruits that they coming in. They've been coming for many, many years and I'm promoting all the fruits and vegetables. It's uh, people are starting to step forward and beyond just the white tablecloth or the high-end groceries across the board demand higher quality food. Keeping some of the junk out as they see it, keeping the antibiotics out of the meat. I believe there's going to be a trend to get GMOs out of the feed source. Um, and we're going to see that come maybe within the next five years. I think there'll be a big push separate from organic just to have no GMOs in food and it's certainly a higher standard in labeling. People are going to want to know more about their food. We're going to see bigger and bigger distributors start to play with something that sounds like local or touches on local. Uh, we're going to see the term local start to get pushed around a lot about what it means. A lot more meat coming from overseas presented as a healthier choice, uh, whether it's organic or grass-fed or some other hybrid. I think we're going to see a lot, we're going to be flooded with a lot more Australian, uh, and South American beef uh, competing with our local uh, beef farmers. But people are forgetting the ethnic markets. Um, you know, supposedly there are 500,000 Russians living in Chicago and no one's really catering to them. Um, the number of Hispanics around our community now is, you know, growing exponentially. And there's limited catering to them. A lot of them, th their distributors come out of uh, Chicago. Certain very high-end chefs would buy whole hogs from us. I'm very proud of it. And talk about using the whole animal. But we were dropping six whole, animal, whole hogs a week at a little Mexican taqueria. So there are places out there that still do things in the old ways that everyone can get along just fine. It's just taking the effort to find that community and work with them honestly. The big cities are a huge opportunity and a terrifying opportunity. Uh, if any, to give you an example, when I sell to a restaurant in Madison, you know, a big order, maybe they take 800 pounds of ground beef in a week. And that's a big order and it's exciting. You hit a similar type restaurant in Chicago and it hits and it may be 3,000 pounds of ground beef. And that's hard on production. You have to understand your scale. It keeps things constantly a dance, keeping things in balance. And there are also a lot of people competing for that business. So when you get into the big cities, understand you're playing with bigger and bigger fish and uh, they aren't always happy to see the little guys swimming around with them. Uh, then the flip side is, then do you hook up with a distributor who can, who can be the big fish in those waters and you're giving away some of your money and you don't have full control. So huge opportunity, a lot of difficulty in playing it. So just tread carefully. Urban agriculture has uh, become something that we feel that can uh, alleviate uh, food insecurity in our communities. Uh, and that's part of the work that uh, we do at Growing Power and part of the work that many organizations are doing around the country. As I travel around the country, uh, there seems to be a new organization springing up uh, to be able to uh, get healthier, safer, affordable food to all people. Uh, I think it's, um, it's, it's really all about social justice to make sure that everybody has access to the same high quality food. Uh, when you think about uh, uh, jobs in this country, every, every uh, job category is connected to the food system. So we need to have all of those people at what I call the Good Food Revolution table 
to be a part of developing this new food system, a food system that works that would create thousands of jobs uh, in this country. Uh, just not a few jobs, but thousands of jobs of being able to grow food uh, inside our cities and close to our cities and, and resurrect the uh, rural uh, aspect of small farmers. Uh, that's what this uh, uh, good food revolution is all about. Not everybody's going to be uh, digging in the ground, uh, but we're going to have other people doing other things. We need folks that are working on finance. Uh, we need, like I said before, engineers and planners uh, to make this work. So all of these things are going to happen in, our, in, our, in the future. And uh, the good thing about this whole uh, a movement that's now turned into a revolution is that young people are now uh, engaged. Uh, people of color are now engaged. Uh, we need to build the infrastructure is what we have to do and there's some particular challenges in terms of the soil that we need to grow new soil, we need to uh, be able to grow, grow more farmers and get more of the community engaged. Another uh, wonderful aspect of, of what's happened is many corporate companies are now joining uh, this good food revolution. So that's going to help us. We need to make room at the table for them. Fifteen years ago, we probably wouldn't have uh, had them at the table, but now it's really important to have them at the table because uh, we need to build relationships that lead to partnerships to be able to, to make this happen. We're a small company. Uh, we produce fresh pasta, ravioli, tortelloni. Uh, Eighteen years in business and trends that I've been seeing, our largest trend being in a flour-based industry is the gluten-free trend. Um, but as far as what a consumer is looking for, regardless of what the trend of the food is, uh, is a, a product that comes with a little bit more integrity, uh, the cleanliness of the food, the sustainability, and the environmental impact. So definitely farmer foods, things that have a farmer focus, um, things that where we know who the farmer is. Um, with our ravioli, we try and purchase direct from farmers. If we don't do the actual purchase, uh, we make sure that who we're working with that's doing the purchasing and processing of pumpkins and squash uh, are actually uh, talking to farmers, looking at the farms, and seeing what their environmental impact is so that we know that as we produce a product, it comes to market with as much integrity uh, as possible. The, our line is farm to fork with a conscience. Big cities, big cities are definitely have growth potential. Uh, big cities also uh, are a little bit more difficult to penetrate um, because big cities also come with uh, infrastructure that's been there for a lot longer time than younger cities, rural areas that really don't have uh, entrenched in a, you know, interior structure. Um, but when you do bring a really quality product to market, um, they are looking for quality products. Uh, it just takes many, many more tries to get them to look at it because so many more people are trying to enter the markets as well. Over the course of time, what we are seeing is um, consumers who have been, or members who have been with us for many years, some of them as many as 19 years, are coming back to us and telling us how much their lives have been changed by participating in community supported agriculture. And what I hope will happen over the course of time is that this will continue to evolve as consumers become more educated. And I think more consumers are being educated as to where their food is coming from, who's growing it, what the growing practice is, does it contain GMOs or not. Um, and as we see that increase in education, I'm hoping what we see is more consumers being more vocal and making those choices um, as to where their food comes from and how it's produced. What we're hoping will happen is also that it will increase the demand for products year-round. Um, and we are in the very, very beginning stages of kind of thinking about what we can do to preserve things um, that are coming off of our fields in the middle of the summer so that we have products to offer, you know, whether it's frozen, canned, whatever the case may be, um, to give people choices in the winter months when we're not pulling things fresh out of the field. For the last several years we've been working on a chicken pot pie project where we can take our number two quality root vegetables in the fall and winter and make a really delicious stock, pair it with some chicken um, and create a chicken pot pie featuring our root vegetables that can, you know, families can enjoy during the winter months. It is not on the market yet. It's been a very a long process, partly because the development of the product is a little bit complicated. There's a pastry, there's a, 
you know, there's a meat component as well as just trying to figure out how to bring the, the gravy portion together with the pastry portion. Um, there's some science involved there. Um, we have gotten it to the point where we're ready to pilot it. We just have to find a kitchen that is equipped and has a, the expertise and the equipment and the certifications to deal with the product that we have. So we're getting closer. It's not quite the timeline we had hoped for. <laughs> so one of the trends that I see um, as we're kind of coming out of a recession or maybe still in it is that people do all kinds of little treats and they'll use food as a treat instead of taking a vacation or going somewhere for a weekend they'll, they'll come to a farmers market like this they'll buy some great food they'll make a great meal they'll have some friends over and so there's a, a much higher appreciation for food and where food comes from than I've ever seen before. So one of the things that's happening as people are experimenting more with food and local is becoming bigger is that that's translating down to the kids. Um, we sample here at the farmers market uh, every Saturday and what the kids are willing to eat is, is really interesting now. Um, young, young kids will come up and eat pesto whereas before the parents would tell them, oh you won't like that. They were predetermining what they would like and not. And, that's a huge difference. So one of the very fun trends is that people are more willing to experiment with flavors. Um, if you walk around the market, the products that are here now are so much more varied than they ever have been. And that's a direct reflection on people's willingness to try different tastes. People are in general much more adventurous when it comes to food than they ever have been. Um, one of the things that I see happening with this local food movement and the infrastructure that will get built around it is that the opportunity for those who want to farm, college students, um, people transitioning out of professional jobs, will have a much greater opportunity to have a viable business. It's because of um, people are more aware of it and there are a lot of people working on the infrastructure that's needed to move those products. So produce aggregation, um, the, the distributors, the big distributors now are really stepping up to the plate and um, helping local producers go into their systems. The Cisco's, the Reinhardt's. Um, one of the pieces of infrastructure that we lack in this area is the ability to take a raw agricultural product and turn it into an ingredient. Many processors can't take raw agriculture, agricultural products. They need um, a certificate of assurance with that product. So the infrastructure to take raw agricultural products and turn them into ingredients is very important. Future food trends I see emerging are the ability for small farmers to enter the market commercially through these legal, safe co-packing facilities that uh, we're helping put together at the Innovation Kitchen. Uh, we've seen some tremendous small farm opportunities, small parts of an acre, sixth of an acre in, a, in the case that just went through, sixth of an acre of squash cleared $3,000. We were able to uh, locate buyers for them, do the processing, bring it in, process it legally, safely, and move it into the market. So I think the model that the Wisconsin Innovation Kitchen represents and future innovation kitchens we're trying to build out uh, represent a access that wasn't in place earlier. Certainly there was room for fresh produce and fresh foods to come into the market, but on a state that's so big and so diverse and with such a short growing season, we need opportunities to make these foods shelf stable so they can be sold year round. So now our new businesses, our new food businesses, but especially our small farms, have private branded, private labeled foods that they can sell directly from their farms in their CSA baskets, on their online websites, that they can sell year round. And it gives a market for the seconds, things that may be smaller than retail uh, outlets are after, the nutrition's still there, the value is still there, all of the inputs are still there, of the water and electricity. Now they're able to capture those costs and turn it into a profit.